We really actively use the, the insights from the great scientists and we are transferring them into the statistical laws, into the laws of probability, the laws of different associative measurements and measures in order to implement such tasks as to create characters in order to create, to change the gender, the change of different characters. We use it for probable um, transfer based on the neural networks for different tasks such as different derivations. To extract the sense and many other things. So, therefore, I'd like to invite you to our team, and if you have any ideas, so we will really be very glad to discuss them and to implement them in our artificial intelligence. So, we can't deal, uh, we can't by read the books. So, and I do recommend to read, to start reading such books as uh, the ones written by Manin, Milchuk and Feynman, and later on continue reading the books connected with the basics of quantum theory, read chunks, and also I do recommend to read some information about the open project IBM Quantum Experience. That's it for today. Thank you for your attention. Andrei, uh, yes, Andrei, thank you very much. Uh, so the presentation is really very exciting for me. This is the uh, new information to me. I believe that our listeners and our viewers have uh, some questions, and I see that there is one question in the chat. So one question from Pom. So colleagues, let's start with the questions from you. So good day. Thank you very much for a very interesting report. My question is, so Qubit is really a panacea, so when shall we have it? So do you have any idea? Well, in fact, we do have this qubit. You, I got the answer during my presentation. We have two qubit quantum computer, which can be extended up to 48, so which is quite good. So mirror qubits that we are constructing, so the only question is to maintain them. Thus, by answering the questions, we should learn how to preserve this knowledge. So it seems that it gives the right answer, but we couldn't um, store it. And one more point is that, well, bit, in fact, uh, well, uh, it will be developed. We have a limited number of situations in the language in terms of sense and meaning. Language is a dynamic system which is developed uh, in the system, so it imposes certain limitations, so therefore we can suppose that qubit information that could be covered for a particular time will be limited. The same happens with bit. So bit is limited by big numbers and the machines, it could take a lot of time for the machines to solve this problem. So therefore we have qubits. So the qubits will find their limits uh, all the time. So in this case, I do like uh, some speculations from Riemann and Pinron from quantum physics. So they uh, believe in the development of different waves, spaces, and strings, and they propose the theory of distributed knowledge. In other words, just like in a movie, have you ever 
watch the film of Johnny Depp, superiority. So the distributed uh, no, uh, conscious looks like that a person transfers uh, um, him or herself into qubits and then distribu uh, is distributed into different spaces. So a person becomes everything and nothing. So, Andrei, thank you <laughs> for, uh, for your answer. I think that's um, a very extended answer. Uh, let me move on to the next question from our uh, listeners. Is it possible that robots could have their own languages different from human language, or probably there will be one common language, just like Esperanto. So, a very interesting question, human-like question. In terms of designers, the robots have their own language, which is not understandable for humans. They interact and communicate with different codes, so they already communicate with uh, their their own language and they have got their Esperanto. Well, in this case, probably uh, the robots, there could be some sense in creating their robot language. For example, Richard Feynman defines the system of language consisting of two types, our internal language, the language that we understand, so the introverts could clearly understand me. And the external language, the language they used to communicate, so which is quite reduced, but it is adapted to our communication purposes in order to convey the idea. So therefore, if a robot would like to find out something new, for example, to find out how to love. So a robot should ask certain questions. In this case, a robot should create simplified language understandable for a human being. So therefore, my answer is that a robot could create a language in order to communicate with a person. Thank you, Andrei. I'm just looking through the question, uh, and the next question, I, I believe, is even more exciting. What do we need in order to create the technology to read the subcontext, in order to understand the irony of a person and to reproduce it? Well, I believe that in case, uh, in case this question was asked by <laughs> Promobot machine, this could be said in, with sarcasm. Yes, I can see the sarcasm in this question, but I believe that the answer has partially been given in the presentation. So all speaking about all these manifestations of sarcasm, happiness, understanding, these are the units of sense. So we can calculate this sense by the formula proposed by Dirac. I believe that as far as we can calculate it, so therefore we can easily transfer that to a robot in a digital form. Thanks, Andrei, a lot. I believe that um, so we don't have enough time for other questions. So, and Andrei, thank you very much for your presentation. Dear colleagues, I, on my part, uh, want to present the next speaker. So let me introduce the next uh, speaker. His name is Diego Faroe, PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Coimbra, associate professor in the Computer Science School of Engineering and Applied Science, Aston University, Birmingham. And the uh, topic of his report is towards socially assistive robotics and human-machine interfaces to enhance wellness and quality of life for humans. Diego, uh, please welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this invitation. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, this talk is about towards socially assistive robotics and human-machine interface to enhance wellness and quality of life for humans. So I'm going to present 
some work that Aston University is doing uh, related to human robot interaction and advanced um, uh, interfaces, okay, for intelligent systems. Uh, next slide provides this work. So if you want to know more about uh, um, our lab, Aston Robotics uh, Vision and Intelligent Systems, you can uh, check later on our website where we have lots of uh, research going on within robotics, vision, and intelligent systems. Okay, so what is socially assistive robotics? If you look at this uh, image in your right here in the slide, we can see that we have humans and robots interacting, right? For a specific goal. So basically, when you talk about uh, assistive uh, technology or assistive uh, robotics, we need to think about uh, uh, in intelligence. When, uh, when we include this uh, word social interaction, we do need intelligence involved. So socially assistive robotics has the objective to endow robotics uh, with uh, skills to assist, provide assistance for humans. It's actually, it's individual assistance in order to, to provide uh, help in rehabilitation, training, education, etc. So it's really useful when we talk about clinical sessions, when we talk about educational settings, and uh, especially for elderly care, um, it's, a, it's a field that is growing a lot in Europe, uh, worldwide, to be honest. Okay, so this is assistive technology. Next slide, please. Ne yes. Um, not see the next slide. Yes, okay, great. So um, when you talk about uh, assistive uh, technology, we need to take in consideration a few topics like uh, autonomous, interactive machines. Uh, we need to think about aid with intellectual, social, and emotional care. This is really important when we are dealing with humans. We need to be careful about the uh, emotional expressions involved. So we have to think about, uh, uh, provide suggestions. When you talk about elderly care, in uh, care institutions or at home. We need to encourage physical activity. We have uh, to think about robots providing entertainment, games, uh, chat, right? Conver intelligent conversation. Uh, the robot must offer companionship in order to monitor uh, older adults, okay? And um, we also have uh, to think about uh, generating safety reminders. So for instance, if an uh, elder needs um, a medication, so the robot uh, needs to remind the elder that, uh, that uh, it's time to take some medicines. Uh, and also facilitate intellectual uh, stimulation. For instance, for child-robot interaction, for educational settings, where robot can help children um, with uh, uh, cognition, for instance. Next slide, please. Can a so robot write a symphony? This audio, but basically, can a robot turn uh, a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Uh, we have when we can talk you? about intelligent robots or AI. In this uh, part of the video, it's a move uh, uh, iRobot. So uh, the human is uh, asking, so can a robot can a robot uh, write a symphony or do a masterpiece, paint a masterpiece? So the robot in a smart way replied, can you? So what do we expect from robots nowadays? Something to think about. We expect super machines. What is AI? Something to think about. Next slide, please. So uh, at Aston University, what we are doing currently is um, we are developing a skill store. It's a cloud-based architecture. Uh, let's say it's a kind of hive intelligence, hive mind, where we have intelligence going on uh, on the cloud, right? So we have skills. We prepare the skill store where we have different skills for robots to navigate, to, to do specific tasks, emotional recognition, etc. So the idea is to, to have a platform agnostic 
which means that any kind of platform can download the skill when needed in order to perform some uh, activity. For instance, we can think about our mobile. When you want a specific app, we can go to app stores and download it, and then we have the, the service in our mobile. So it's the same thing. We have a robot in a specific scenario where the robot cannot uh, handle some uh, specific task. So the robot can download some uh, skills from this store and uh, use, adapt, use the, the algorithms, the, 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 the uh, stored knowledge on the cloud to execute a specific task. Of course, during this process, the robot needs to learn, adapt. And this learning process, this uh, adaptation is stored later on. So it's uploaded on the cloud so that our skill store becomes smarter, smarter, and smarter. So imagine that we have uh, five robots in five different uh, uh, houses, uh, collecting data, uh, learning new, new tasks. So we can store off this knowledge, uh, the training the models, let's say, and the decision making that was made uh, on the store. And later on, a new robot can download these uh, uh, same skills, can use a, a smarter, let's say, skill with more knowledge. And then we can transfer this knowledge to other domains. So we have a transfer learning. And also we have, uh, we are working on on, uh, on the fly real time simulators so that we can grab data from uh, the sensors on board on the robot. So we use this data on simulator, uh, perform some learning, and then we get the answer. And after that, we know that it's safe to do some task. then the robot execute in the real world. So uh, what is the difference from what we have so far? The difference is because we are storing a new knowledge. We are accumulating knowledge and we, are, we have this kind of uh, personalization, anticipation, adaptivity, okay? Uh, so basically the robot, robot is an interface, the mind is on the cloud, the robot download these skills. Next slide, please. So um, here is one example that you can see. Uh, how we can use this uh, uh, platform. So basically, what we want to do is to work with perception, reasoning, and interaction. This is a loop, okay? So the robot uh, perceive the environment, the surround environment, uh, make decisions on the data acquired uh, from the sensors, and then perform some task or interaction. So we are developing this architecture. We have an example here in this uh, left image where we have, for instance, facial expression, body motion recognition and voice recognition. So we have multimodality. So we have a lot of things going on. So we have a, a fusion process where we can use this uh, multimodality in order to make a decision. For instance, if a robot ask for, uh, recognize that uh, an older adult is sad, so the robot is going to look at the, the, the facial expression, the, the, body, the body expressions, and it's going to recognize that and it's going to ask to the, to, to the older adult, um, you seem sad, can I play a song to cheer you up? Let's play a game. So the robot can, uh, uh, in an intelligent way, interact with the older adult. And of course, all this knowledge is going to be stored, okay? Uh, for To use inter for learning and uh, to adapt to new context. Next slide, please. So here we have a few videos. Can you play our videos for me, please? So, um, in the first video, in the, the top left, we can see uh, child robot interaction. Uh, yes, child robot interaction, uh, where, um, previous slide, please. So here uh, we see applications. So we are using these skill stores in different applications. Can you play our videos, please? Uh, so um, uh, in the first video, on top left, we can see a robot interact with uh, a child uh, with uh, autism in clinical sessions. So the robot has skills for natural language processing to chat with the, the, the child, can recognize the emotions and can uh, invite the child to interact with uh, this robot. Because uh, kids with uh, uh, autism, they have some problems to interact with humans. However, they get engaged, enthusiastic with the use, with the use of technology. So they can interact better with robots and animals and pets, for instance. Uh, 
rather than humans. So this is a good way in order to use uh, technology to assist uh, children with some disorder. Uh, so the robot is extracting facial expression to recognize emotion, as you can see in the, in the middle uh, video, in the, the left column. So we can recognize facial expression based on, on a face. We can also have the skills to recognize a gesture to control prosthetics, to control robot uh, hands. And we have also possibility to, to recognize activity based on body motion as in the top uh, right uh, uh, video. So the robot can monitor uh, people, elderly, can recognize what's going on, like walking, running, falling to prevent uh, fall, right? So if the robot detects some uh, risk situation, the robot can call for a doctor for responsible for the elderly, you know, to say uh, something wrong happening. The, uh, the person is, is uh, um, fell down, something like that, okay? And the, the, the video in the bottom right, you can see a wheelchair controlled by EEG, brain waves. So the idea is to have an autonomous wheelchair uh, to navigate in an environment building a map of the environment. At the same time, we can detect the brain waves to, co to control the, 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 the wheelchair, to go straight, forward, backward. And of course, if the wheelchair detects some wrong command, like go to the left, and in your left, there is a wall. So the robot's not going to, to do that action, okay? So next slide, please. So basically, for all the views that you saw, we are using a framework called Dynamic Bayesian Mixture Models. So this framework, as you can see in the left image, is, uh, has a multimodal perception architecture where you can grab data from different sensors like cameras, uh, RGBD sensors for depth map. We can then feed this information from different modality to different models. As you can see there, Mixture 1, Mixture 2. So each mixture uh, means that we can have different the learning models there, classifiers, uh, machine learning techniques like uh, reinforcement learning, deep learning, classical machine learning techniques like support, support vector machines, etc., etc. So for each modality, we can uh, find some uncertainty and then we can uh, provide rewards or penalties. So we can say mixture one, which means that modality one, sensor one, is more confident than, than the, the second sensor. So you provide weights uh, to, to provide more certainty, more uh, confidence to, to the modality so that we can fuse, make a fusion of this data to make a decision. So if you know that we can rely on a camera better than laser, then of course we're going to provide more certainties for the models, uh, for the results coming from the camera. Okay, so it's the more or less the framework that we work right now. We can combine multiple algorithms of AI into this framework. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to start showing some uh, case study. Uh, also um, a component in our skill store on the cloud that is emotion recognition based on facial expression. So as we can see here in the left image, on the top left, we have data sets. So we have uh, images um, from human actors performing static uh, facial expression, like uh, happy, just smiling, right? Fear, angry, but is, these images that we have in this database, in this data set, are static images performed by actors. They are not uh, real emotions, they, they are just uh, uh, figurative, let's say, they are just uh, people pretending some emotion, right? So we try to extract some patterns of facial expression on these images. But also we collect data set based on uh, emotion that is, uh, that is awakened by videos. As you can see in the middle image, the top middle, where people is watching movies and we try to trigger emotion, real emotions. So we grab this kind of information to learn specific kind of uh, expressions. So how do we handle it? So we, basically we detect landmarks on the face as you can see in the top right image in feature extraction. We detect uh, points on the face, these landmarks. We compute the distance among the, the, the landmarks, angles, 
and the spatial temporal uh, features, which means that we analyze uh, temporal information. We check the previous information from previous frame, next frame, we compute uh, angles, acceleration, so we can see the muscles of the face changing over time. And then with this information, statistical data that we extract from handcraft features, we fit uh, machine learning techniques inside our framework, dynamic Bayesian mixture models. And then we can classify. Right now, in the beginning, we could classify 84% of accuracy, of certainty, of emotions. But right now, after looking at, at uh, videos on YouTube and uh, multiple data sets and storing this information on the cloud, we, we can uh, currently classify over 93, almost 95% in real time of emotion. So we can uh, uh, really detect uh, facial expression in order to estimate the internal state of the person when interact with the, the robot, okay? So next slide, please. So uh, the second case study is about active recognition. Again, we use a sensor to detect deaf images, which means that we have the, 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 the perception of the distance of the sensor. Then we can detect a skeleton. Uh, our, uh, we can detect joints uh, of the human body. And then we can extract features like a distance between the, the joints, angles, velocity, acceleration, and other statistical and moment uh, features. Then uh, we feed the classifier with this information. As you can see in the video right now, uh, the robot is moving, uh, trying to find a human. Once the robot finds a human, we can detect the skeleton, we can extract features. Uh, we can, uh, and then the robot can uh, classify what's going on. Now we can see a uh, the human falling. So the robot can recognize that the person fall, uh, fell down. And then uh, the robot uh, ask if the, the, the person needs some help. So the robot can call for assistance for a doctor, something like that. And they compared our techniques with multiple state of the art uh, techniques. And we are achieving uh, over 94%. Um, of accuracy when recognizing walking, running, uh, fighting, sitting down, working on a computer, drinking water. We have uh, multiple classes, okay? Next slide, please. So uh, finally, uh, uh, we can, uh, sorry, we can merge all of this into a robot to interact with humans as the example that I showed in the beginning for child-robot interaction. Next slide. So finally, this last uh, case study is really, really interesting. No robots involved, but, but AI and uh, human machine interfaces. So we are using brain waves. So we have a child interact with a computer game, but it's an intelligent game. So the game can adapt and personalize to the child. So we are using a sensor, a headset, headband on, on the, the, the forehead to extract uh, brain waves. Then we are using a leap motion sensor to recognize gesture, so the, hand, the, the, the child can control the game using the hands, not a, a, a control, but the hands to control the game. And also extract facial expression to recognize the mood of the child when playing the game. The game is a directional game based on reasoning, memory, attention, math, okay? So we can extract brain waves. So the idea is when the, the concentration level pattern that we detect from the sensor, from EEG, electroencephalography, uh, detects that the concentration is going down, the system is going to adapt and generate some uh, stimulus, visual, auditory, or change the phase in order to keep the attention of the child while playing a game. This is a neurocognitive training. So we intend over time, using this kind of technology, to improve the attention uh, of the child with attention depth. ADHD disorder, okay? So uh, in the second image in your, in your right, we can see that uh, we are going to try to, uh, uh, previous slide, please. Yes. So the, the, the image in your right, we are trying to generate signatures of, of brain waves. So the idea is to collect uh, data from multiple children with non-clinical children, which means that the ones that don't have any disorder, then we extract a signature, a pattern of the brain waves of concentration. So we represent one signature for, for 
for those kids. Then when we check a child with a disorder, we try to compare both signatures of brain waves. And we intend, we, what we want to do is to uh, reduce the similarity between both signatures over time. So the idea is after three months playing our games, we want to, to get closer uh, the signature of the child with the, the template, the desired one. Of course, they will never going to be the same because a, a child with a disorder is not going to be like a non-clinical child. However, we intend to reduce this uh, problem with attention, okay? So next slide, please. I'm going to finalize soon. Uh, so basically, we extract uh, mathematical features from uh, the EEG. Next slide, please. Then we convert these features uh, into images. Next slide. Next. Yes, next. So we get these features, these mathematical uh, models, and generate an, an image. The, the right image that we are looking at are brain waves, uh, the mathematical features. Uh, to represent some uh, signatures. And then we feed the signatures into a deep learning model in order to classify if his uh, child is concentrated or not. Next slide, please. So regarding results of this, uh, of this approach, next, yes. So regarding results, can you play? Yeah, this is just to show the scenarios. Uh, first of all, we do some calibration. The first video that you can see in your top left our child playing just to calibrate the sensor so we can have an idea what concentration is for that specific child, okay? Different techniques into one, uh, and then we could achieve 90% of, 97% of certainty when we, that we can detect that the, the child is concentrated or not, okay? So we can see in your right uh, image uh, that uh, during our tests, children, could concentrate 78% of the time uh, when playing game using hand gesture and 74% when using traditional games using the mouse, okay? And we did some transfer learning. We got knowledge that we have stored in the cloud to initialize our deep learning models instead of generate random uh, values. So we could uh, uh, use a model pre-trained uh, for this case here, which means that we did, did some transfer learning. We got knowledge from other domain when people were using uh, EEG, adults, and we used this knowledge for the, the children. So we did a transfer learning. So this helped us to achieve 90% uh, uh, of accuracy when uh, 9 plus percent of accuracy when classifying this data. Next slide. Then uh, we did some questionnaire to check the acceptance of the, the, the experiment with children. Uh, just to summarize the, 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 the interview that we did with them, most of them pre uh, prefer to, to use the hands to control the games. And uh, they 100% agreed that it's a nice uh, game to play. Uh, they don't get bored. The only thing that they complain is that uh, playing the game for a long period, they get tired of doing gesture, okay? Next slide, the last one. So basically, just to let you know, um, to conclude this presentation, is that uh, uh, I'm going to be focused on the UK where I'm working. The UK is investing a lot of money in robotics and AI, so this is the future using smart technology, uh, assistive technology to help humans in business, in agriculture, uh, cobots, collaborative robotics in, in, in industry, for all automation, etc. So we can see the market right now, uh, estimated value worth uh, $4.5 trillion by 2025. Uh, so it's a lot of money for this field, okay? So what kind of investment the UK is doing right now? The government uh, has uh, 93 million to invest in research projects to help industry, SMEs, and also research institutions, universities, uh, with grant proposals, you know? So we have to apply for this, uh, this project and then we get money to, to, to work in partnership with other universities and the industries uh, industry in order to, to uh, 
um, so improve uh, um, so this this field of AI and robotics. Okay, so next slide. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so thank you so much, Diego. Uh, it's really amazing and really interesting our presentation and your speech. Thank you so much. And uh, if it's possible, uh, the first point is that I want uh, to say that uh, you know I absolutely share your vision um, when you spoke about high expectation for robots. Uh, it's real, to my opinion, it's real huge problem for the area of service robotics. Uh, and we in Promobot get it, catch it every day, permanently time. And uh, I absolutely agree with you in this point. So um, as far as I know, we have a lot of questions, uh, a lot of Provide. questions uh, for Diego and uh, dear colleagues, let's start. Uh, I, I know that the first question from City of Perm, from our colleagues, uh, please. Uh, Diego, thank you very much for your interesting program, uh, for your interesting report. And uh, you know, I am a teacher, and my question is about education. Uh, you know, recently, Promobot company opened an online master's degree in service robotics at the Perm Polytechnic University. And the main feature of this program is that students remotely connect Provide. to students. It's a virtual uh, robotic uh, laboratory. And uh, w uh, what about the uh, educational experience in the field of robotics at Aston University? Share your experience, please. It's really very interesting okay. to us. Thank you very much for, for your question. It's uh, really good to know that Promobot is uh, uh, getting engaged with education and uh, this kind of course is really, really important. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, one thing that's really interesting is it's an online uh, um, remote uh, course uh, where you mentioned that uh, you are going to use uh, labs and Provides. robots in a virtual way, right? This is quite interesting, uh, but of course we have to, to look at a lot of uh, issues like uh, safety if they are using real robots online we, we need to ensure that uh, they are going to do the the, the, the right moves the, the right things so um, but it's really 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 nice so at Astor university right now we have a master in ai where we have uh, modules like robotics and autonomous systems applied machine learning deep learning where we get engaged with uh, machines not only robots, but uh, any kind of uh, technolo technology involving IoT, Internet of Things, wearable technology. So basically, it's, uh, our course are on campus right now, right? So uh, I teach robots and autonomous systems where we have a lot of simulators. We deal with the ROS, robot operate systems, and many simulators for uh, one example, for autonomous vehicles, we have uh, simulators as well where students can use simulators to learn how to apply uh, machine learning and autonomous systems for later on getting uh, in touch with the Provide. robots, okay? So, but we have also modules where they start from scratch. They have to build their own robot, like the Lego approach, you know, where they can have uh, work with Arduinos and pieces, they can do the, the electronics as well. Uh, but uh, we have to think about uh, the future because with this pandemic, we have to think about online courses right now. And this is a good strategy that you mentioned that Promobot is doing, uh, preparing an environment where students can access online the labs, the robots. Of course, here we have data sets where right. they can use the data sets and simulations so far, but we need to adapt to, to allow them to use our robots. They can use right now remotely our server, uh, our GPU server, where they can use the processors online through uh, VPN, right? So they can connect remotely uh, and then use our machines, but not robot yet. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Diego. A lot of questions. Sorry, uh, next question uh, from uh, internet, from YouTube. Uh, Diego, you often mention human-robot interaction throughout your talk. Do you think 
it is essential for a service robot to look like a human during the interaction with a real human. How important is that for the robot to be anthropomorphic or not? Yeah, uh, it's a good, interesting question. So basically, uh, we have lots of, when you talk about human robot interactions, we have lots of issues. First of all, the design of the robot, right? So we need to avoid this uncanny valley situation where people get scared or, you know, get, uh, uh, don't trust on the robot. So Provides. there are a lot of studies right now together with psychology where they check uh, the appearance of the robot, first of all, the design, the head, if they should be uh, humanoid or not. Right now, based on state of the art, uh, robots like Pepper it's, it's, they are the ones yeah. that they, they like, you know, that looks like yeah. cute robot or pet robot. Yeah. Uh, the robots that look like uh, germinoids, you know, like the, the Japanese uh, versions or that look like babies, uh, they get a little bit scared at the beginning. So it's a matter of time for you Provide. to get used to this kind of robot. So the appearance matters, okay, for specific scenarios, for elderly care, for instance. So they have to trust on the robot. So if it's a cute robot, they trust more. So there are lots of studies based on, on design. This is one point to think about. Another point is, uh, should it be anthropomorphic? So a robot should have hands, blue human-like hands, not exactly. Grippers might work. You don't need to have legs, like uh, uh, Pepper, for instance, Pepper robot, right? Uh, like now robots, they have legs, but uh, it's very basic, right? Um, again, this comes back to the first point. The second point is the robot should pay attention, look at the, 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 the human. This is a good question. Basically, not the robot itself, but the sensors, yes. Because we have to grab Great. it. Uh, yes. th thank you, Diego. Uh, uh, our next question. Um, so, um, Diego. Uh, Okay, it's not so interesting. Uh, Diego, do you think the robots will entirely replace human communication? Is it possible or not? Uh, this is, <laughs> this is a, a question that people sometimes think about uh, robotics and, and AI. They are going to dominate, they are going to, to, to do everything. I think we are, we are far from that right now because we have, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, what are our expectations? What's going to happen? Sure. I do believe that they can achieve uh, degrees of intelligence, degrees of, uh, right now, for instance, machine learning can recognize uh, objects better than humans because they use cameras with high resolution or low resolution. They can recognize objects more than, than humans, faster than us, you know? But uh, this does not mean that they, they can control things. The future, in my point of view, the future is human in the loop. So we are going to we talk about AI and human, okay? So we have to, to have this coordination, human and robots. Uh, when you talk about communication, when you talk about intelligence, we should have human in the loop because, uh, um, yes, we have algorithms nowadays that they can evolve, that they can uh, make autonomous decisions, but we are still far from what you see in movies, uh, in my point of view, but... Uh, I don't think that we should worry about this Provides. right now. And we have to think about collaboration, how humans and robots can work together in order to improve business, uh, wellness, uh, well-being for humans. Absolutely. I'm on the, your side. Uh, Diego, thank you so much. Uh, okay. It would be, it, it will, it was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, you. So um, we go, uh, what our next uh, speakers I, I am glad to introduce uh, our next speakers there are stanislav, stanislav ivanov uh, from bulgaria and also craig webster from united states uh, stanislav uh, phd in economics from uh, warner university of management bulgaria vice rector at warner university of management bulgaria Craig Webster, PhD in political science from Binghamton University, MBA from Inter College Cyprus, associate professor in the Department of Applied Business Studies at Ball State University, United States. And the topic 
the topic of uh, report uh, is the uh, economics of service robots in travel, tourism, and hospitality. Really interesting topic. So, Kalex, uh, let's share your thoughts. Stanislav, Craig. Yes, hello. <clears throat> Today, uh, Stanislav and I will be presenting. Today, Stanislav and I will be presenting on the economics of service robots in travel, tourism, and hospitality. Um, we have a bit of knowledge and experience with this, so we're really pleased. We're really pleased to help you with this and discuss this with you today. Next slide, please. A little bit about us. Stanislav is a professor and vice rector at Varna University of Management in Bulgaria. He's also the founder and editor in chief of European Journal of Tourism Research and the editor in chief of, of the new journal, Robonomics, which should be excellent. He's also CEO of Zangador, an important operation. Next slide, please. I'm Craig Webster. I'm associate professor in the College of Business at Ball State University in Muncie and editor in chief of Tourism Today. Next slide, please. Um, part of our background is a few years ago, we started working on the economics of service robots and how they, we expect them to be incorporated further into travel, mm -hmm. tourism, and hospitality. So we're, we're really sort of excited about this. We, our book came out last fall, I think it was October in 2019, and it's been fairly successful. And if you wanna know more about service robots and a lot of what we'll talk about today comes from our, our book, please um, have a look at our book and, um, and this will help inform you more about how we expect the future to be in terms of the interaction of humans and robots in the incorporation of robots in travel, tourism, and hospitality. Next slide, please. Thank you, Craig. I will continue with uh, the economics of service robots. Next slide. Uh, first, I will present the economic framework of service robots adoption in travel, tourism, and hospitality that is uh, elaborated in greater details in uh, the book. Next slide. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the conceptual framework of, a, of a the economic uh, adoption of uh, service robots in tourism and hospitality, because uh, the framework, framework is a little bit large, we split it into two slides. Next slide, please. Uh, the upper part of uh, the framework shows the impact of tourism demand on tourist companies. We have the tourism demand influencing the business processes in uh, companies like marketing operations, human resources, and finances. This impact goes through different, uh, in different ways, through the willingness of pay to, for tourism uh, products, through the perceived service quality, the, the service process uh, participation. Every company experiences the, uh, the influence of, the, of uh, competitors' actions. However, competitors also experience the influence of tourism de demand on their business processes, again, through the same processes like willingness to pay, perceived service quality, and uh, service process participation. If a company decides to use robots artificial intelligence, uh, instead of human employees, or in addition to human employees, this influences its competitiveness and financial performance. The managers of the company need to perform cost-benefit analysis in order to decide whether it is worth to invest in robotic technologies. Next slide, please. However, these technologies have certain advantages and disadvantages compared to human employees. And there is a substitution versus enhancement effect, which we observe uh, in them. This is, the, this is the bottom part of the conceptual framework, which shows the relationship between robots, artificial intelligence, and service automation as production factor and uh, um, compared to uh, human employees. When the company decides to use human employees, 
it creates demand for human employees on the labor market and which demand faces the supply of human employees, which is defined by the number of human of potential human employees that are available on the labor market, the skills that they have, and the wages that they require in order to work in tourism and hospitality. On the other side, if the company decides to use robotic technology, artificial intelligence and service automation, or RACER for short, the company creates demand for such technologies, which faces the supply for, uh, uh, for RACER technologies on the RACER market. And this supply is characterized by the technical characteristics of these technologies, the prices of uh, service robots, for example, but also what skills these, uh, these technologies require in order to be properly used effectively and efficiently by the users. So there is a mutual influence between the supply of human employees and the supply of uh, robotic and uh, artificial intelligence technologies, uh, not, uh, uh, not only through uh, the prices, but also through the skills uh, that uh, the human resources have and the required skills uh, uh, for the successful use of robotic technologies um, that are required. Between the human employees and the racer technologies, we have substitution and enhancement effect. The balance between these depends on uh, various factors, which uh, uh, will be discussed a little bit later in the presentation. But in short, these are the productivity, the marginal rate of substitution, costs, economies of scale, economies of scope, the service capacity of the tourist company, the automation of tasks versus automation of jobs, and also de-skilling versus upskilling of jobs. And now Craig will continue with uh, uh, explanations about uh, the benefits and the costs of using service robots in uh, tourism and hospitality. Next slide, please. Yeah, one thing we should look at here is in terms of the economics of service robots are the benefits. That is, because there are benefits and costs, we should focus first on the benefits. And why should service robots be adopted? And um, next slide, please. And there are a lot of benefits to robots. A lot of the benefits are a, a relationship to human workers and comparisons against human workers. Um, and some have to do with just the capabilities of robots themselves. First of all, robots could possibly work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is in stark contrast to what humans can do um, in, order, in, in addition, they can do various tasks, although many robots now just do one task, it is possible with the proper software and hardware that robots can do multiple tasks and different types of tasks. Um, in, in, in another thing to consider is that they will fulfill their work correctly and in a timely manner with the correct software and programming, that is a possibility. Um, we also have the idea that robots can improve constantly the quality of what they do. Um, in addition, one of the key factors here, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about dirty, dangerous, and dull things, is that robots can do quite uh, routine work repeatedly, um, something that humans many times don't like to do and don't really excel at. Next slide, please. Um, again, more, a lot of this also has to do with comparison of a human workforce. That is, why robots? Well, there are certain things robots don't do. First of all, robots can't really complain. I suppose, I suppose you could program complaining into them. And, and I imagine at one time this will happen. Um, robots don't typically get ill. They may break down and need repair, but they don't get ill the way humans do. And I think now in the era of COVID, I think we can appreciate that. Um, robots do not yet and don't, uh, and in the foreseeable future can't work in ways to organize and, and strike. Um, they can't spread rumors. Uh, they can't discriminate. Uh, they can't quit their job without notice. They can't show negative emotions and they can't shirk from, from work. 
Um, again, these first two slides in terms of why robots really illustrates why the robot is the sort of prototypical stakhanovite. Next slide, please. So we have this idea that, that you know, the political capability to organize and strike does always bring up the question of can these jobs or tasks be replaced with automation? And this comes from Star Wars with different words, of course. Next slide, please. Um, other reasons why you, you'd want robots. The first thing is labor cost savings. Um, since they can work many hours and they don't get salaries the way that humans get salaries, there is a potential for cost savings from, in terms of labor. In, in, in addition, you also have that question of, of selling things because many customers see uh, robots as a curiosity and there's, there are 24 hours a day, seven days a week availability, you can increase sales. And just as a side note, the Henna Hotel in Japan, um, had it not been almost entirely staffed by robots, might not have been such a popular or noteworthy thing. I wouldn't be talking about it now. Again, because of the novelty, and it's, 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 its business is based upon that it's robot based. Um, the other issue is planning operations and scheduling. Because they work 24 hours a day, cannot get ill, complain, shirk, organize, strike, and other things, you have more predictability in the system. Um, in, in addition, there is that always that issue of environmental sustainability of the operation. And you have the question of robots not cr necessarily creating a lot of waste. Um, and it can eliminate a lot of unnecessary activities. Next slide, please. So one, there are some other aspects. A lot of them are comparisons still with, with the human, but in some things that are a little bit different. For example, robots lead to an increased role of the customer in the service delivery industry. That is your interaction with the robot many times is a bit different than it is with the, hu the human. So you have more of a prosu uh, prosumer approach. And again, uh, part of this is, uh, I'm old enough to remember the old days when you went to a bank and you had to meet with a bank teller to get money. The interactions that you'd have with a human would be slightly different and much more limited than an ATM now, which is a machine that does the same job, which is distributes money to you. So there's a slightly different process. Um, uh, the other thing is they, they save employees time. Again, one of the aspects that we're looking at is the three Ds, dirty, dull, and dangerous, that robots can, um, can handle these types of tasks that employees don't typically like to do or that are a risk, such as the, the, the dangerous elements of a workplace. Um, they can enhance what an employee can do. Again, if you have a delivery robot in your hotel, you can send that robot to a room to deliver something instead of you having at the front desk as the only employee maybe at a night shift to send to go up and leave the desk. So it enhances what one employee can do. Um, there is also that issue of the labor force and the flexibility or lack of flexibility in a labor force. Robots give employers a great deal more flexibility um, in terms of, of what they can do with their labor. Next slide, please. And then robots can be fun. Robots enhance the, that perception of service quality. Here's a picture of a child riding on a, on a, on a robot that's vacuuming. Um, they, they can do things differently. And there's still somewhat of a novelty in a lot of aspects. Um, for example, communications in different language and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even professional interpreters may not have so many languages. And of course, humans get tired from translation. That's why simultaneously translated or people that work in simultaneous translation to have to have, take regular breaks. Um, you don't need this for a computer and for a robot. Um, and then we have the ideas that that robots create value. Again, this goes back to that Hena Hotel in Japan that was able to be entertaining and a novelty because it incorporated robots into its operation. Next slide, please. Um, again, why robots? Again, robots are still somewhat of a novelty and in, in a lot of places and they, and they lead to a, a positive word of mouth um, due to the image of being an innovative, high-tech um, 
cutting a cutting edge company. So the the incorporation of robots at this time in in our in our history is a sign of being innovative, new, different. It's a differentiation strategy. Next slide, please. But there are also some costs, and there's good reasons not to use robots at this juncture. Next slide, please. Um, they lack creativity. This becomes, for many of you that have an anomaly that occurs and you're, le you're led to an automated response for that, um, it becomes quite um, difficult um, because they can't be creative and respond to quite unique situations. And this is a true limitation of the current robot. Next slide, please. Um, there are other reasons. La there's a lack of flexibility in their delivery systems because they can only do what they're programmed to do, very specific tasks. Um, they will not be independent of human supervision. Um, I, for example, I could talk from my experience last year with delivery robot in a hotel a manager still had to follow the robot so that it could make the delivery to my room. It, it needed that human supervision because it couldn't actually get onto the, uh, the elevator without human help, uh, sort of undermining the ability of the robot to do what it should do, which is save labor. Um, they lack a personal approach because they're programmed and they're robots. They're not humans and they can't interact the way yet, the way humans do. Um, they can't, they can orient only in structured situations and they can't think outside of that, which is the benefit of what humans can bring to the table. Um, there are privacy and security concerns, um, facial recognition technology and other issues lead to the question of where are those data going to and who controls those data. Um, and then there's also that question of, of negative publicity. That is robots could lead to the perception that the company is, is, is considering robots more important than humans. Next slide, please. Um, again, there's this more sort of historical thing that humans have perceived a lot of labor-saving technologies and innovations as being a threat to human employees. Uh, the Luddites, uh, which is from, the concept comes from uh, uh, industrialized in England, uh, were afraid that the machines would take over the things. And there's a long history of this, that machines were taking over the jobs of humans and, and replacing humans with another um, entity and machines. Next slide, please. So, and there's the other question of different industries um, being put out of business because of the change in, in labor you, by, by using robotized labor. And there's an example, you know, there was a time when the horse versus the automobile was a big issue. And there are benefits of an automobile over the horse and there are benefits of a horse over an automobile, but it largely put um, some businesses out of business effectively. Next slide, please. And why not robots? Robots aren't really consumers the way that many consumers are consumers. And here's a picture of Stanislav at going to the spa. And again, if you pay a human employee their wage, the human employee will go and there's a trickle down effect into the economy. There's a whole um, ramifications for where people spend their money and what they do with their money that you have in a normal economy in which you have human labor. When you've replaced human labor by robots, you don't have necessarily the thriving service industries that are dependent upon a wage labor based economy. So there is Stanislav spending some of his good money at a, at a spa. And had he, had we had a, a robotic Stanislav Ivanov, he probably wouldn't go to the spa, but he might need some repairs, uh, but it wouldn't be at a spa. Next slide, please. Um, so there's a question of how you fit that balance of robotized um, labor versus human labor. And that's something Stanislav and, uh, and I are looking into is what's sort of a good ratio of robots to humans or humans to robots. Um, there are questions of company characteristics and culture. Um, do, does a company want to be innovative and have lots of robots, or does it want to be sort of an old style um, entity and, and use lots of human labor? But those are our sort of cult, company culture questions and characteristics of what the company wants to do. And then you have the other question of you know, relative costs 
of labor and technology. And if labor is inexpensive, why would you use expensive technology? Um, if you need flexibility in labor, maybe you want to use more technology. Or, so you have this, this question of the degree of technological capabilities. What is the company capable of doing? You have also the question of the consumer. Does the consumer want to interact with robots and be served by robots? And there are some interesting things to be said about who wants it and who doesn't. Um, that's another thing Stanislav and I have looked quite closely into. Um, then we have cultural characteristics of consumers and service providers. Again, there are, it's no mistake or accident that the first robot, well, the Hena Hotel in Japan is in Japan because that the, the culture there of Japan is quite pro-robot and, and robot friendly. Uh, it might be different in different places. And then you have other safety characteristics of robots from which they can be a risk or something that is rewarded in terms of safety. Next slide, please. Now we move back to Stanislav, who will, or no, I, no I'll, I'll talk this one, then we move to Stanislav. So the question of that, it's a question of a balance. What's the right balance in terms of how how much how much automation using robots is needed versus the other end? And there could be different markets that are looked at. So we have this bifurcation of a high tech and a high touch economy, a high tech economy being those entities that want to work, those businesses and companies that want to work within a high tech way and other ones that uh, see a lucrative market in the high touch um, market. Again, sometimes we talk about sort of different ways of delivering the same thing. For example, your massage chair is a machine that delivers a massage. Would people like a massage from a chair? How much cheaper does it have to be? How much are you willing to go to a human to massage you? More, what are the risks of working with a human? The cost of human labor versus the massage chair? It brings up all sorts of issues about what is the best way to deliver this? And now I think we move to Stanislav, who will talk a bit more. Thank you, Craig. I will continue with the substitution versus the enhancement effect of a human employees and robots. Next slide, please. So um, this problem of uh, robots versus humans was, uh, uh, was discussed uh, uh, many decades ago. Uh, so we can see that it was popular in cartoons on a robot was created to enhance Zayats in Nupagadi. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the most, uh, inf uh, uh, when we talk about uh, substitution versus enhancement, we need to consider that uh, uh, we talk first and foremost about automation of tasks. Uh, so versus automation of uh, uh, jobs. And uh, one of the most uh, influential, influential paper uh, published uh, three years uh, ago, uh, this is probably the most cited paper in the field of uh, robonomics with uh, over 6,000 citations just for three years, stated that uh, nearly 50% of US jobs are susceptible to computerization. However, if we look deeper into the methodology that uh, the authors use, we see that they talk about automation of jobs. However, uh, in practice, automation happens on task level. Task level, like inputting data into a reservation system, cleaning floor, delivering pizza, producing a sales forecast, de uh, delivering a room service order, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, uh, robotic technologies, they always have both substitution and enhancement effects simultaneously. And uh, the balance depends on uh, this, the automation of tasks versus automation of jobs, the relative productivity of robots and uh, human employees, the service capacity of uh, the company. Next slide, please. Uh, when we talk uh, about the relative productivity, we need, to cons we need to see how much revenue the robotic technologies generate compared to the costs that are necessary to, uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that are necessary to, um, uh, to maintain these robotic technologies. So if the revenue per dollar cost for robotic technologies is greater than the revenue per dollar 
of, uh, of uh, labor costs, then we can see that uh, the robots are more productive. So if we spend 1,000 uh, euros for uh, robot technologies and they generate 3,000 euros, uh, but uh, we spend 1,000 euros for labor and uh, labor produces 2,000 euros as revenue, obviously the robots are more productive. In that case, the company will have uh, stimulate to use robotic technologies and to substitute the human employees. However, here we have uh, one pitfall. It is very easy to calculate the costs, the labor costs and the robotic related costs. However, it is very difficult to calculate the revenues that come from the robots and the revenues that come from labor. For example, uh, when Craig ordered uh, his room service, uh, the hotel made costs for the robot and for labor. They can be calculated, but, he may, but uh, how will the revenues be divided between the robot and the human employee? This is a question that needs to be answered in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, when we talk about the automation of a task versus automation of jobs, we can say that every job is a set of tasks. And when, uh, and when uh, um, robots automate specific tasks within a particular job position with, and if the same job position can be performed by a person who has um, lower education, then we talk about this killing of jobs. Practically uh, a job consisted of, let's say 20 tasks. Now it will consist of only 15 tasks and the person uh, 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 with a lower education and with a lower salary will be able to perform it. So this is de-skilling. And here we talk about uh, uh, that the substitution effect prevails. However, we, have, we can have also the opposite situation when the use of robotic technologies forces the employee to have more skills uh, because they will need to perform new tasks which they previously did not perform. This is called upskilling of jobs. In that situation, enhancement effect prevails. Next slide, please. The service capacity is also important. If, for example, the robots can expand the service capacity of the company, or they can increase its utilization without uh, uh, the company, uh, without the need for the company to hire additional staff, or if the additional revenues that the robots generate are higher than the additional costs for human employees, then what we can say? We can say that practically the robots increase the productivity of the company and they decrease the cost to serve one customer. In that situation, the enhancement effect prevails. Next slide, please. However, if we have the opposite situation, we have, a, we have a company with a fixed and well-utilized capacity. The possibilities to increase the revenues are marginal. They are very little. For example, a hotel with a very high occupancy rate, or if the maximum demand is limited by this fixed capacity. In that case, the company will focus on costs. The profit of the company can be increased by decreasing costs. And it will focus on the substitution effect of robotic technologies. Next slide, please. So what is the exact mechanism of substitution and enhancement? Next slide. Let's say that we have one simple company with three processes that consists of uh, different tasks and three different job positions. The rows show the tasks that belong to a particular process, while the columns, they show the tasks that are performed by a particular job position. Next slide. When we introduce uh, 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 service robots in the company, different effects happen. First, some tasks are eliminated. These are the tasks with the dark gray. Other tasks will be reallocated. This is with light uh, gray. Third group of tasks, they will not be changed, but also there will be newly created tasks. So what will happen? With job position one, it will be completely 
eliminated job position because practically six out of eight tasks will be uh, automated while the other two tasks can be reallocated to another job position. So it will be eliminated job position. For job position two, it will be enriched with tasks from other job positions. This is uh, uh, because two of the tasks will be moved from position from job position one to it. Job position three will be enhanced with newly created tasks, which did not exist before uh, the introduction of uh, the service robots in the company, while a new job position four will be created. What can we say about the processes? Process one will be completely automated. Probably the process will still continue to be performed in the company, but it will not be performed by human employees, but by, but, uh, by service robots. Process two will be partially automated. Process three will be not automated, while process four will be newly created. And the next slide shows how uh, the processes and the job positions will look like for human employees after the automation. Job position one does, uh, is not included anymore, while process one is automated. Next slide. So what we can summarize is that robots and automation technologies in general, they eliminate tasks for some human jobs. They help reallocate tasks to other jobs and create new tasks for existing and new job positions. This means that for some jobs, substitution effect will predominate while for other job positions, we shall have enhancement effect. But we shall have always both. The question is, what's the balance? Next slide. And what we, uh, Craig and I would like to tell you is technology is a tool, it's not a goal. Next, because uh, we can have uh, a wonderful technology, but we need to use it wisely, effectively and efficiently. Because we can have fantastic robots that we want to use in a hotel, but, uh, if we don't, but if we uh, don't make our calculations properly, if we don't have a program for their introduction, proper introduction in the company, in one week they will, uh, they may be uh, used for a completely different things. So thank you so much, and uh, we are available for your questions. Thank you so much, Stanislav and Craig. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It was uh, amazing. Uh, really interesting uh, speeches. Uh, actually, it was so interesting uh, listen for me because I am producer and manufacturing robots, and uh, I understand that you provided and developed absolutely huge, uh, interesting and useful work, uh, and uh, that more important that it's really real practice. Uh, information from field market. I think that it's really, really uh, useful information for all development of robotics. Uh, thank you so much. We have, uh, and also now I understand why not robots. Robots <laughs> don't go to the spa center. Yeah, is the main point. And if uh, our guys from sales department uh, listen to us, please remember it. It's the main argument. It's a joke, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, so uh, I, I know that uh, our uh, city of PEM waiting uh, that ask the question the first. Uh, uh, Alex, please welcome. Hello. Uh, I have a question for you. As you've mentioned, uh, robots are very good at uh, performing uh, monotonous work, uh, right? But what about some critical situations, some emergency situations? Uh, well, they are not good at them, right? So, and right now we have to have a human who can uh, act, who can make a decision, make a right decision uh, uh, in this situation, what do you think? Um, will it be uh, a human-only position to make critical uh, uh, decisions in emergency situ situations? Because, um, for example, if we are speaking about the hotel industry, um, 
So we evaluate the quality of service by uh, the way the people solve our problems. For example, we, when, we have, when we fail to uh, check in at the hotel. So what do you think about it? Thank you. Okay, uh, shall I answer the question? Okay, uh, what I can say is that uh, we can, uh, uh, the previous speaker mentioned that uh, we have to keep uh, the human in the loop. So there are diff we can have a human, in, human on the loop, in the loop and off the loop. So in some situations it, or for some decisions, it is much better to have a, a human making the decision. So emergency situations are probably some of the uh, are probably some of these uh, situations where the human will be able to make a decision faster and also to consider all the different aspects of uh, uh, of, of the emergency. Uh, however, uh, uh, that's why in that case probably a robot is not a good uh, uh, to be used to to make the decision by itself. However, the robot will be able to help, for example, if there is a robot that can carry a person uh, so that uh, if uh, there is a fire in the hotel, so that the, uh, the robot can be, will be able to, uh, to help by order of, uh, of a human to carry the guest outside. But of course, the decision itself should be made by the human. Uh, but uh, the implementation can be performed by a robot, allowing, uh, uh, provided the circumstances allow this. While in other cases, of course, for simple things like check-in, check-out, provision of uh, information about the destination, these are routine tasks which a robot can easily handle. And by the way, for these things, it's not even necessary to have a robot, a simple kiosk checking kiosk, which is not a robot, can, uh, uh, can do the work. Stanislav, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So next question, please choose who will, uh, who, who will answer. Uh, in your opinion, what will prevail, high tech or high touch? Do you think the high touch side become a more affordable and alternative to high tech? So, for example, instead of hiring a teacher, a person would have uh, to use their smartphone for distance education. I think that's a good question. Well, let me answer this, I think, and, and Stanislav, let me know if you disagree with me or, or <laughs> you can embellish. I, I think that we're going to see a, the formation of two different markets. I, I think the majority of the market will be a high tech market because it will deliver the, the services that people demand as long as it's cost effective. There will also, there will be those people that want a high touch market that are able to pay for those services delivered by a human using human intelligence and the interactive capabilities of humans that robots, at least in the foreseeable future will not have. So I, I think there will be a sort of a, a large market for example, hotels that are, have no robots or virtually no robots and everything's done by a human and if there's a cost effective way of having a fully robotized or automated hotel, you'll have that as well. But there has to be, I, from what the research Stanislav and I do, is we see that people expect a cost savings when robots are brought mm. into the picture. Stanislav, I don't know if you want to yeah. embellish or disagree with anything. Yeah, I, I can I conf, uh, completely confirm uh, what you said. Uh, our research practically showed that uh, if uh, that customers want on average something like uh, uh, at least 10% discount and on average about 20% discount for tourism services that are completely automated, delivered by tourists, but sorry, by robots, compared to uh, a service uh, completely delivered by human. So uh, a hotel which is completely staffed by human is uh, let's say 100 euros. Uh, uh, the ser if the service is completely automated, the price should be at least 10, 20% lower, so about 80 euros. Mm. This is what we have found in our global survey. Interesting, got it. Uh, thank you so much. A lot of questions, so next, uh, next question. I think that it's rather interesting too. From is a bit of a segue to the next talk. 
but where do you stand on augmented humans and cyborgs? Do you think they have a place in your high-tech, high-touch theory as one of those cases from the gray area? I mean, hmm. where is the cyborgs? Stanislav, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, what uh, can I say is that for the moment, uh, Craig and I consider robots and humans as two distinct species, not uh, uh, species that are uh, crossbreeding. So uh, this is what we focus at the moment. So uh, human robot, uh, um, human enhancement through uh, such uh, technologies uh, will probably happen in uh, the next uh, three, four, five decades. Uh, it, we don't think that it, it will happen uh, sooner, but uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So we might be surprised. Okay. Who knows? Okay. Uh, clear. Next question. Um, uh, so, uh, five seconds. Can robots be utilized in medicine? Do you think robots will be more in demand after the coronavirus pandemic? Yes, yes. I say yes, yes, and I'll let Stanislav embellish. <laughs> yeah, what, uh, yeah, what I can say is that uh, definitely, ro uh, uh, definitely robots have a huge role to play in medicine in different aspects. Yes, First, they can be used for disinfection of, uh, of uh, uh, the hospitals. Second, they can help transporting things, items in the hospitals. Uh, they can be used to clean the floors, but also robots can be used to assist surgeons in, in performing medical surgeries. Like, uh, and such robots already exist, like Da Vinci robot. So practically uh, it will be, um, well, uh, of course it's not, com it's not completely automated. It supports, it enhances, it doesn't substitute. The but uh, yeah. the, the type of Star Wars robots that uh, substitute uh, humans and they have uh, uh, human and beyond human level intelligence, probably this is uh, far beyond in the, into the future, if it ever comes. Yeah, and the next last question uh, about the future too. So if we download the human consciousness into the robot, who is he going to be? What are going to call it? Do you believe that it's possible? Well, well, that that's an interesting question because you start dealing with sort of when is a robot a human, and the ethical dimension of that is when when they get human rights. So it really goes back to our definition of what is a human, um, and this has a massive ethical uh, connotations, I think, for a society. Um, again, we're pretty far away from that, but it's still a conceivable question to ask. And the ethical dimensions of that are massive. Um, because if we start considering robots human, then we might have to treat them differently. And that's just a matter of downloading human consciousness, whatever that is. And I'm not even sure how, if we can ever define really what human consciousness is, because it's a fair, it's, first of all, it's socially based, that concept and defined, and it's massive. It's not a very specific and narrow thing. I don't know if Stanislav agrees or disagrees yeah. or can embellish. I completely agree with you and uh, practically I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Craig. Thank you so much, Stanislav. It was so pleasure to discuss with you. Thank you so for your time. Thank you that thank you. you connect. Uh, thank you. Спасибо. 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 So uh, we are go uh, next uh, to next speaker. И я, наверное, могу перейти на русский, чтобы представить нашего следующего спикера. Илья Чех, генеральный директор компании «Моторика», производитель биоэлектрических протезов, предприниматель года по версии Ernst Young, со своим докладом, очень интересным докладом, киборгизация, как робототехника изменит облик человека в будущем. Илья, тебе слово. Да, Леш, большое спасибо за представление. Всем привет, друзья. Thank you very much for presenting. And for the introduction, thank you to everyone who is present here, who is watching us online.
Uh, for a long time I've been wanting to visit this city, to visit the center of Russian robotics, and it's really impressive. Uh, we've been talking about how robots are going to replace people, and now we are going to speak about the, when keyboards are going to replace both. Robotics is very different, and uh, my team, my company, uh, our aim is to develop technologies develop uh, robotic and, uh, solutions that could have an impact on the image of uh, uh, human, our functionality, on our longevity. And, um, uh, today I'm going to give you an overview on the human augmentation, how prosthetic limbs are developed, what we have already done, and what we are going to do in the future, starting with history. The start of the process of developing such uh, devices for human augmentation is um, the middle of the 1980, uh, 20th century. In 1958, they created the first um, artificial hand with an interface that could uh, read the gestures, phantom gestures of that person was making. And, um, it would give it the command to the limb. This was the first example of an interface in an attempt to control an external device and to modify human person. Then, in 1985, the first artificial heart was implanted and uh, present over 2,000 people have received such an artificial heart and are living with it. In 2006, the first uh, organic eye, Argus II, was implanted. This is not completely functional eye sight, but the person can only see some uh, images, some hazy objects, and the the uh, visual brain is, has been implanted with an electrode network that is stimulated with electric current, and it allows a person to see some images in their head. An important event happened in 2012 during the London Olympics, and um, South African Athletes, Oscar Pistorius took part in that uh, those Olympics. He had two prosthetic legs. He and uh, he was faster than any professional sportsman. And after that, he was disqualified because he was too fast. And so he had to run among Paralympic athletes. This is the first important event when a person who was, um, uh, who was challenged, physically challenged, actually outran healthy athletes. And uh, recently, another important event happened. The Neuralink company of um, Belonging to Elon Musk has demonstrated the first prototype of a neuro interface performed on guinea pigs. And uh, the, the number of electrodes is impressive. It's over 1,000 channels of electrodes. So the quality of this interface can enable it if you put such uh, electrodes on motor brain, you can read the movement of uh, fingers and uh, make uh, robotic processes perform those commands. In general, if you collect all the technologies around the world um, uh, that are replacing different organs and limbs, about 70% of human body can now be replaced by 
functional analogs. It's clear that uh, many of those devices are sti still clinically tested and uh, don't function perfectly, but still there are already artificial livers, uh, hearts, uh, vessels, uh, blood, eyes, ears, uh, hands and, uh, and legs. And uh, so in fact, everything that is vital can be upgraded and replaced and a person with such modifications will live longer than they would live otherwise. We'll go a little bit around the, the main spheres of our work, the upper limbs and lower limbs. I'd start with the lower limbs. Prosthesis, because today, if a person can use the most up-to-date uh, prosthetic leg, uh, which are now produced only in the U.S., uh, and uh, you can imagine that uh, a person is walking towards you in the street wearing pants. You will never understand that this person is wearing prosthetic legs. And it is this engineer who, who is developing such prosthetic legs. He himself lost his legs while climbing, and now he has created the most modern laboratory for creating such prosthetic legs. And so the functionality um, of prosthetic legs has now reached the maximum. And so you cannot see the difference between a um, person walking using their own legs and prosthetic legs. And uh, now this sphere is uh, developing in a little different way. I have already mentioned this athlete. He has special prostheses that use the biomechanics of a cheetah's uh, paw. Uh, which enables him to run a lot faster than normal people. There are other pros <coughs> prosthetic legs that can enable people to uh, climb rocks, and they are based on uh, rock um, goats, mountain goats. Now prosthetic legs are specializing in some narrow spheres for specific people, and uh, the important thing is that any person can have a set of those um, prosthetic legs. Like some people choose what trainers they will wear today. A person can choose what prosthetic legs they will wear today. If they, um, depending on whether they want to run faster or look higher or taller or etc. So, um, a person gets enhanced abilities in this way. As for hand prosthesis, um, for the past seven years, our team has been working in this field. We know everything that is going on in the world about it. And I'll tell you about uh, what we do and uh, why the future is with us. First, we need to point out that the upper limb prosthesis, there's still a lot, a long way to perfection. Still dozens of years will take until it reaches perfection. We were young and um, unexperienced when we started, so and we thought that we would just it take about a couple of years to make perfect limbs, and uh, after four years we realized that it would take us another 30 years to make a perfect pr prosthetic ha hand. From the very start in our team um, we took the ideology that we are not going to make prosthetic hams that would just uh, be able to take something and uh, carry something and put it down. For people who live without a hand for a long time, they get used to uh, working with just one hand and they don't need another limb to grasp things. So we decided that we would make prosthetic hands um, which would uh, function as a gadget, which would make a person's lives um, 
uh, person a more convenient way uh, for in interacting with the digital world. And now the digital world is um, more important than the physical world. For us, it's more important to sit with a cell phone and to look something, watch something on television than to actually make something by hand. So all our prosthetic hands are made to function in a digital way. They all work with touch screens, they have uh, GSM modules, so they can be used as touch touch pass, so you can pay for things using your prosthetic hands, you can take uh, telephone calls, you can give out uh, Wi-Fi. And um, we are developing in this paradigm. Our task for the future several years is to integrate uh, the whole functionality of a smart uh, phone into that prosthetic hand so that a person would not need any other gadgets, uh, remote control, um, intelligent uh, house uh, control, uh, coffee machine control. It's all possible. Uh, te uh, technically, and this is what we are trying to do. And the second aspect is the design. Um, a prosthetic hand should look good, it should cause admiration, it should, should show that a person is not like everybody else. It's not disability, rather it's, a d it's an advantage. And, um, the, mo the greatest technological barriers in hand prosthesis have not been overcome yet, and there's a lot to do there. Uh, first and foremost, it's the feedback, the senses, the most important thing that our fingers have, it's the sensibility. It's the, you can touch things, you can understand its temperature, its uh, structure and so on. And a prosthetic hand cannot do that at the moment. And as soon as artificial skin is created, something that could give them uh, senses to the brain and the to the nervous system and give a very clear uh, native uh, reaction uh, when you have touched something or have taken something, then at this moment we can think of um, replacing your actual hand with a prosthetic hand just to try something new. And as uh, the previous speakers have said, a lot of work is still there in this field and uh, maybe um, the, uh, it will be reproduced uh, massively in the next 25 years. Uh, there are other companies that are trying to do the same things and the image belongs to some Italian uh, scholars who have um, achieved to get some basic uh, sense that is transmitted from a prosthetic hand. But until it becomes mass market, a long, a long time will pass. So we do have a lot of prototypes. Nearly all organs have their prototypes, bionic prototypes, artificial ones. However, just as we've said about the sensibility for the prosthetics, the artificial organs, we need to have a lot of time for clinical trials, for simplifications, for improvement, and so on and so forth. So today, the safest application of invasive technologies uh, is about the electric chips, which could be implanted into hands or legs, and, uh, for example, to record your ID, your transport card. So these are the things that the biohackers do. And they are trying to improve their bodies. Well, why not? It's a kind of improvement upgrade. You don't have to carry a lot of cars. You just touch uh, the screen with your hand, and it clearly understands what you want to do. And here is one more very interesting case with this young man. The point is that he was born with uh, a disorder of seeing the world in white and black, and he had surgery in Barcelona. 
he, well, he had special electrodes implanted in the brain, and he had a special camera that detects the colors around him and sends the signals to the inner ear and transfers the sound into colors. So it means that he could see the colors in the sound spectrum. So the case is exciting as uh, the fact is that, well, he's from Great Britain and once he decided to change his passport, so he was not allowed to, uh, to be photographed so with antenna and he was trying to prove that this is his integral part, this is not just glasses that can be taken off, in fact, this is the part of his body, just like when you, you can't um, put off your hand. So he managed to prove that this is his integral part and he is considered to be the first cyborg with passport. And here we have one more ethical side of the issue that has already been mentioned here somehow. The point is that we have a person with a hand or land prosthesis in case anything happens, uh, for example, this prosthesis can be broken. So in this case, what crime it is? Is it damage to the property, just like, for example, damage to a smartphone, or it's about damages to the body? As far as prosthesis is a part of the body, it's just like when you break your hand. And these are the questions which have been asked in the society and we as the developers and designers were trying to make people aware of these issues, we're trying to communicate uh, within the expert communities and trying to develop this area. As far as we clearly understand that it's quite inevitable, so sooner or later we're going to be modified by different implants and technologies. So if we want to be competitive in the future world, in this case we, we have to do that just as we all study English because we understand that we can't live without English. So the same is about the implants in the future. So here are a number of pictures for the prototypes of different organs, um, including artificial lungs. So left um, bottom, a very interesting thing. In kind of it's a pancreatic gland with a year's storage of insulin, and it is integrated in the human body and monitors the uh, uh, glucose level in the bloody in, in, in blood and ejects the insulin into the blood. And the point is that the more modifications the human body has, the more critical the uh, cyber security issue is. So just like, for example, any phone can be hacked and have an access to any bank account, the same can be with the pancreatic gland, so it can be hacked and so it is programmed by uh, YouTube con uh, connection, so in this case it can be hacked and uh, uh, an insulin dose could be injected into the blood to kill a person. This is one more point that should be paid special attention to in terms of the device security and safety. Well, as the society is being transformed, we could see well, to be more specific, we, we can see that different events, competitions, concerts and movies will be transformed uh, to have more uh, cyborgs in them. So Cyberthlon is uh, a championship. So um, it took place in 20, uh, 2010. It's a kind of an analog for Paralympics. But for people who use high-tech rehabilitation devices, well, last year it had only six categories, hand prosthesis, limb, um, leg prosthesis, wheelchairs with uh, electric simulations and so on. But the point is that unlike the Paralympics, people are not limited in the technologies that they use. 
So the more advanced the technology is, the more chances you have to win. So it's, the point is that nearly any research team, companies, research centers can participate in this competition. Even the prestigious is are not satisfi satisfied and um, are not proved to be safe, so you can apply to this competition. So when we visited this uh, uh, competition, we get, got acquainted with my team from Japan. They had uh, a very huge camera with a lot of cables connected to the hand prosthesis, a lot of different tubes and cables. It looks really very exciting, so I should have added the picture to the presentation. But that, that's the point of this competition. So, in fact, it's a kind of a platform to test, to pilot, to market, to introduce uh, these technologies and teams and people who would like to uh, improve themselves. And I've already mentioned this point, uh, we are the developers and we should think about the safety and security of the devices and very often I say that my team uh, could be burned for all that we have done one day. And our task today is to make people aware of this area and our teams uh, are de developing the foundations, the background for the world that we are going to have in the future and what foundation we have will impact uh, the future, whether we shall use it for the benefit or find more disadvantages in this. We've been developing um, this area for five years, so there are we have uh, introduced more than 1,500 prosthetics in 12 countries, and right now we, we are a leading company in Russia, in uh, Eastern Europe, in uh, SIS countries, CIS countries in this area. And just to recap my presentation, uh, I will just, uh, uh, I'd like to cite Yuval Noah Harari, the author of Homo Deus. You want to know how super intelligent cyborgs might treat ordinary flesh and blood humans. Better start by investigating how humans treat their less intelligent animal cousins. So, therefore, I wish you all the best, and I wish us to have more implants in the future. Uh, well, Ilya, super. Ilya, thanks a lot. So, more implants in the future. Uh, I believe that так, this uh, is the word for <laughs> Promobot no, uh, so, conference. Uh, words, uh, by English, uh, I start one more. Um, Несколько слов на английском языке о наших информационных партнерах. Илья. Uh, yes, more implants in the future, uh, so let us get back to our questions. Well, in fact, we have a lot of them, so let us try to choose the most important ones. This question uh, from our Russian information partner from high-tech platform. So when can neuro-interface give us an opportunity to read the memory of a human being? When will it be possible? Also, I'd like to add one more question to this one. So what do you think, when uh, do the prosthetics from Elon Musk be available to all people? As for the neural interface from Elon Musk, I believe this is the state-of-the-art project which is rapidly developed uh, in this area. 
so now they are uh, focused more on the interface for academic research for the universities rather than for ordinary users. But in fact, when they are done with the technologies, they will move to the consumer market and the interface will be a mass product. But considering the interface, it's really very difficult uh, in the um, in terms of the life, life, uh, life of this prosthesis. Well, I believe that these products could become mass in uh, 20, 10 years. Well, uh, in terms of technology, they could be ready in five years, but in order to uh, verify their safety, so we should have very long tests, and only then they could be introduced to the mass market. As for reading the memory and uh, conscious digitalization, I think this is the direct consequence of uh, the development of these interfaces. And by now, we uh, do have some experiments to transfer the thoughts from one person to the other via the neural interfaces. And uh, they were quite successful. So. One person imagined something, and the person on the other end uh, stimulated uh, the, the cortex and uh, triggered the images of the other person. Well, there were some limitations, some barriers, well, but still quite interesting experience and experiments. Well, I believe it is quite achievable, but uh, it's a long-term goal. So how long do you think? Well, about 40 years at least. Okay. So first, we start, well, I'm talking about a fully fledged, uh, full replication of conscious. Well, in 10 years, we will start to reproduce some images, some uh, memory, part of the memory, but but as for the whole memory, Simon, that will take uh, Ilya, a long time. Uh, some questions so. from our English-speaking audience. Uh, assuming all the people become cyborgs, are we going to be a unified human entity, or there will still be different sexes, uh, nationalities, and uh, identities? Mm -hmm. Very that's a very interesting question, and I believe that we will have more diversity uh, with the appearance of new technologies, new artificial organs. In this case, uh, a perfect hand prosthesis does mean that you, you can have only two hands, you could have four hands, why not? So the same is true for the other things. As for nationality, I don't think there's anything new on the market. Oh, so I'm sure. Yes, yeah, speak about gender. Will gender be changed? So will there be a third gender, a fourth one? Well, just like when you just uh, uh, choose your gender in your smartphone. Well, I do agree with you in many aspects. Sorry to interrupt you, but, but this is um, what I'm thinking about, and I believe that there will be some battles and maybe a kind of a group uh, of people who are more efficient with not two hands but four hands. Do you think professional sports will be in any way different from what we have today? Should we expect augmented Olympics and events of that nature? Yes, we have already spoken about that. I believe that that all aspects of society life will be changed. We, we can have new concerts, new com sport competitions, even pop culture, probably new movies, and so everything will be uh, adopted to the new reality. And even if we uh, look at the society now, maybe nothing comes to my mind. Uh, um, if you're speaking about a movie with no hero, with a prosthetic hand or arm, so even now it is really very um, a developing area. But still I believe that there will be people who will stick to the classical Olympics, who will be interested in some classical Olympic competitions that will stay with us. And even now, if we look at the society, we see some agrarian sectors who 
live uh, in nature and is just the reality and this is a feature of the society, a part of the society, to live in the past and to think that uh, 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 it was better in the past rather than it is now. So people will not develop on the, on the technologies. And in this way, our society will really be very diverse. So the time in pressing, uh, yes, so we have a lot of questions, but uh, I just want to note one more time to emphasize that I'm really very glad to see you here in Palm. So, and, uh, uh, it's really a pity that uh, I'm not in Palm and I, I believe that we will have such an opportunity to communicate. On my side, just to recap Promobot's talks, I'd like to thank all the speakers who managed to uh, be in Palm, who could find the time uh, to participate in this conference. And speakers from Bulgaria, United States and United Kingdom, thank you so much. Dear colleagues. So, and I'd like also to thank our colleagues from Promobot, Andrei Nosov, so who uh, opened our conference, Promobot Talks, and I'd like to thank everyone who organized uh, this conference. I'm sure that they were really very nervous about this, but considering the number of the attendees, uh, Online думаю, attendees, I can see that this experience was really конечно, very successful and if we get the right response and feedback and support from the users, uh, I believe that наверное, this format will become a standard for us and it means that Ilya and other colleagues uh, uh, will be invited to uh, Promobot uh, Talks. Uh, so, dear colleagues, attendees, and Promobot team and speakers, one more time, thank you very much. Uh, so, it was really a pleasure for me to listen to your presentations, uh, to you experts. I believe that our conversation was really very fruitful and exciting. Uh, one more time, thank you, one more uh, Thank you very much.